there's mics, right? People. There, that's. Ah, where it's. life. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you, Dries. <laughs> and thanks to everyone who's coming here. Uh, yeah, so that was another excellent keynote that you've done for, for Drew Bhutan. Thank, thank you. But I'm sure many people have questions. So if you have any questions, I think there's some roving mics, but also you can, oh, yep, yeah, so the people in black t-shirts, uh, if you put your hands up there then. So if you want the microphone, just wave your hand and he'll sort you out. Uh, and you can also ask questions through the app. So if you go to the program section in the app, you can go down, find the, the Dries Q&A, and, &H, and uh, in there you can ask questions, and that's what I'll be looking at. So, question to get you started. All right. I'm really excited about all of those contributor tools that Tim talked about. So when did he say that it would be all ready? When can we use them all? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, Probably a question for the DA, but because <laughs> uh, they're a small but mighty team. They have a lot to do. Um, but some of the things are already available today. And so they use this kind of sort of rolling thunder where they continuously uh, you know, launch new capabilities one step at a time. My guess is, I don't know if any one of the DAs here actually, Neil is there. Neil, what's the answer? Because I shouldn't be guessing. <laughs> I couldn't hear it, sorry. He would be guessing too. He would be guessing too. So yeah. it's ready when it's ready. <laughs> so is the eventual plan to uh, discontinue the issue queue on Drupal.org and move entirely to GitLab? Sorry, is it what is what this? Is the plan to remove the issue queue on Drupal.org and move entirely to GitLab? Yeah, it's also a question for Neil. I think we want to move everything over, yeah. Like the the vision really is to use as much of GitLab as we can, because if we have two different systems at the same time, it, it actually creates more work, not less work. <laughs> and we really want to just go all in on GitLab, where it makes sense, obviously, um, and just rely on GitLab. And then we get the innovation engine from GitLab, because uh, obviously they're now a well-established company. They're adding a lot of capabilities. There is a whole ecosystem of integrations with GitLab. And so we just want to tap into um, you know, all of that, and I think if we keep too many Drupalisms, like sometimes we do, uh, it, you know, like a lot of these opportunities and integrations just don't, um, you know, we, we might not be able to fully take advantage of GitLab that way, you know? So one of the reasons it's taking a little time is one, we have a small team, as I mentioned, um, doing a lot of work. Two, we have 20 something years of history and content and issues, which it's very complex, you know, 40,000 something projects. <laughs> Just core alone is a lot of history. And so all of that needs to be migrated. And interestingly enough, um, you know, we built our own infrastructure, but um, even the GitLabs and the GitHubs of the world, they don't have all of the capabilities that we have. Like we really built something over the years that allows us to scale to a project the size of Drupal, where we have 40,000 integrations and we have a million users on Drupal.org and we have 10,000 people collaborating on Drupal any given year. So we've built this massive, massive collaboration tool and GitLab and GitHub wasn't necessarily invented for projects like Drupal with the scale and the complexity of Drupal um, and so a lot of what we need to do is actually push <laughs> GitLab, in our case, to add the features that we need to run and manage a community as large and as complex as Drupal. And so the Drupal Association has done a wonderful job collaborating with GitLab, and GitLab has been very generous as well, contributing time and, and money to help us build these features. And they're also very eager to, uh, to work with us. Um, I'll give one more example, if that's okay. Yeah, go um, ahead. But like, you know, Drupal pioneered this uh, credit system that you might be aware of. And we have integrated the credit system in our, you know, collaboration tools. And that doesn't exist. <laughs> like, because we were literally, you know, the first or one of the first to have this. And GitLab is very interested in having a feature like that so they can make it available to 
every other project in the world that uses GitLab. Um, and so when we think about how do we bring the credit system into GitLab, it's not like a quick, um, it's not necessarily an easy, quick effort, you know. There's a whole lot of uh, work and thought and design thinking that needs to go into that to uh, not only migrate the existing credits, but also to evolve it so it can be applied to the uh, conceptual principles of GitLab, which is a little bit different. And then also, it, they want to then make it available to every other open source project <laughs> in the world. And so they have to think about how do we make it reusable beyond Drupal as well. And so just wanted to highlight that, you know, to show like, you know, we are leading the world sometimes in how we work and the tools that we have to build uh, Drupal with so many people. And, you know, GitLab doesn't have all of these features, <laughs> funny enough, right? And so it takes a while to, to, to get all of these things done, and which is why it's hard to say it's going to be done, you know, in three months or in six months. But um, I've been very encouraged by the pace, though, of the, mm. of the progress. Every time we meet at DrupalCon, there's a whole bunch of new features. That's very oh. good. I really like the, the Kanban board view of the issue queue because I find that really difficult to, to navigate and, and manage as yeah. a maintainer. Yeah. So with all the work that is going on, like on, say, that initiative, but also other initiatives that you have, like how is that all being funded? You mentioned the philanthropy and the grants. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so one of the things we... Want to, want to start doing is um, go after um, grants, as an example. So there's a lot of organizations, could be government organizations or philanthropic, philanthropic organizations that um, have grant money, you know, that will make an investment <clears throat> in a project, hopefully like Drupal, um, you know, when, you know, our ideas and principles are aligned with their vision. And, you know, um, I'm actually presenting on Friday this week at a conference of the European Commission. Um, and they have billions of dollars in grants. Um, and at this conference, there are some high profile policymakers and grant makers. Um, and they invited me to present at the conference because they want to learn from Drupal and open source collaboration. Um, and they also use Drupal, by the way. <laughs> but they like how Drupal is a global community with local, um, you know, uh, communities as well, and, and how we all work together. And they want to apply some of that thinking uh, to other industries in the European Commission because they recognize that Europe is a collection of smaller countries, but if we can all kind of work together, maybe in a Drupal-y way, <laughs> that they can build something bigger across country borders. And um, anyway, I'm not saying they'll write a grant, but I'm saying grants are available. And historically, we have never uh, tried to get a grant. It's All right. Not, never tried to apply for? I don't, to the best of my knowledge, we have not. We had a few grants as it related to the, uh, around COVID. I uh, forgot okay. what they were called, uh, forgiveness things. Yes. Um, anyway, but we've, we, we really have never applied for grants. Um, and so we're going to try it, uh, which is nice, uh, and see what happens. But imagine we can get two or three million dollars a year in grants, and we can use that money to promote Drupal or invest in uh, strategic initiatives for Drupal, those kinds of things. That would be pretty nice, right? And uh, we have a team now. Uh, we hired a person, Kristen. And she has a long background and a lot of experience with grants, uh, grant programs and raising uh, money um, from different institutions. And uh, she's coming in very excited and ambitious, and hopefully we can um, get some grants. And that would be another way to help grow Drupal and sustain the project. Yeah, applying for grants is like a whole other skill set that yes. you need. <laughs> Yes, and that's why you need people specialized in it. Um, yeah. So we never had that skill, but now we do, which we'll see what happens next. So there used to be a Promote Drupal initiative before. How is, the, how is that going to differ from what the current plans are? 
Yeah, I think Promo Drupal has been great, uh, first of all, and uh, a lot of people have put in a lot of great effort. Um, sometimes I still think, and I don't mean this as criticism, we're only scratching the surface sometimes of what we could do to promote Drupal. And so it's really about you know, doing what promote Drupal does and then more. Like how do we give them more resources and how do we support initiatives like that more broadly? And um, you know, it, it goes all the way from making sure Drupal is present at relevant industry events to having more and better content on Drupal.org as well. I mean, if you think about it, if you go to Drupal.org, it's actually really hard to learn about, you know, Drupal <laughs> in a way, uh, in some ways. Um, like if you were to go to websites of competitors, they would have a lot of content for all of the features they have. Like I'll give one example, but let's say our workflow tools, our content workflow tools. We have some of the best content workflow tools in the world. But it's really hard to go to a page on Drupal.org <laughs> where you can learn about here's Drupal's workflow tools and maybe with a little video and really tailored for people that are sort of curious about Drupal and they're trying to assess if Drupal would meet their needs. Same thing with multilingual. We're really good at multilingual, but do we promote it well? You know, If you are new to Drupal, you're trying to figure out is Drupal a fit for my project, it's not that easy. And so we miss, for example, long story short, <laughs> we miss sort of the classic product marketing content, which is promoting the features and the capabilities of Drupal. And uh, you know, for, for every feature in Drupal, which is maybe 100 features or, or more, we should have a page that explains the feature in a way that helps people understand what Drupal can do for them. Um, so I think there's a lot to do, you know, I'll, I'll go beyond what we do <clears throat> today and also promote Drupal for different verticals or industries, uh, promote mm. Drupal to different uh, buyer personas, you know, developers obviously, but also marketers, like really good content for marketers or good content for, you know, CIOs, like um, and, and, and other kind of more strategy oriented roles. Um, and to me, and I've talked about this in the past, but like I think about this like we've built sort of one of the world's best engineering machines <laughs> and one of the world's largest engineering teams with 10,000 plus people. Like why haven't we done the same on the marketing side? You know, why, why can't we get hundreds of people in the Drupal project uh, market Drupal together just like we do for code? Okay. So I think there's a lot of things there that we can try and I think that could be pretty exciting. We have a question from Tony in the audience who says, you'd like to, to do better at promoting Drupal. The story is so inspiring. So isn't it time for Drupal the movie or the book? <laughs> is it time to, for Drupal to move? Is it time for the Drupal the movie or Drupal ah, the book? Wow, that would be cool. Um, I don't know. Yes? <laughs> oh, <laughs> trying to picture what this movie will be about. Um, <laughs> It might be a nice like, documentary-style movie, maybe, you know? <laughs> Could be fun. <laughs> Another question, going back to GitLab. Um, so is it the right path, do you, path sorry, do you, you, do you think, to offer the option to opt in for GitLab, as described in the keynote in, in the video, or would it be better to do a cut and only support GitLab? Um, it, I don't know what the best process is. I mean, I think the end state is GitLab. I'm pretty clear about that in my head. But how we get there, <clears throat> I think we're doing sort of a gradual, um, you know, get there step by step. And we have to think a lot about how we manage uh, a change like that, right? So I think change management is pretty important so we don't disrupt, um, you know, Drupal. For example, we are about to release Drupal 10. We don't want to, <laughs> in the middle of the Drupal 10 release process, kind of make things impossible or hard. So we have to be very careful about how we roll out these features and how it impacts our, um, our packaging scripts and our, you know, all the things that we have <laughs> that we've built over all the years. So the end goal is GitLab and GitLab 
only almost or as little Drupalisms as, as we can. Um, but yeah, we just have to get there in a, in a, in a gradual piece that is, brings everybody along and doesn't disrupt the project. We don't lose anyone on the way. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in relation to the marketing effort, another question, uh, you mentioned the different industries and the different verticals. Uh, Miro is wondering, should we pick specific segments and that we're trying to go too broad, perhaps? Yeah, well, I think Drupal is already broad. <laughs> I think the power of Drupal is that it's very flexible. Uh, it scales from small to large, uh, from simple to complex, and, peop and because of the plugability, the composability, <laughs> and all the modules, Drupal is being used in every industry today. So th that is a fact, right? Like every industry uses Drupal. So I think it's a strength uh, right now that we are the platform that can be used across every industry. Um, so I think we should try and promote it for multiple industries. Uh, having said that, I do think there are industries that we're better at than others. You know, like we continue to be really good in, um, in government, in higher education, um, you know, media and entertainment. And so, yeah, we have a lot of amazing references there. Uh, but even in, in, you know, other industries, we're getting better and better references. Like I've seen a lot of people in financial services ad adopt Drupal in healthcare adopt Drupal. Like in these were traditionally industries that were a little bit more maybe reserved about open source, maybe a little bit less risk taking, um, but they've gone all in on Drupal as well. So, um, you know, given, given the size of the install base and given just uh, incredible organizations using Drupal in all of these different industries, I, you know, I think we have to promote all the industries really. Um, so how can we help promote Drupal? Is it case studies? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think that's what I meant with um, it would be helpful if we had um, sort of that coordinator role, you know? Because if you think about it, like we have all these amazing Drupal agencies, and guess what they do? They're often in the marketing. <laughs> they help their customers market um, their customers by doing brand design, content creation, website building, you know, not everybody is a pure website builder. A lot of the agencies in Drupal, they're like full service firms <laughs> and um, are marketing experts. And so we have all this talent in our community. Uh, but what I see missing sometimes is kind of like, how do you organize um, Coordinate it all. across them all, right? And, and so when you ask how can people help, well, there's a million ways you can help. <laughs> we need all the contents. We need, we could translate the content to different languages. We need campaigns. We need uh, all the things. Um, but it feels a little bit like unorganized and people don't know where to get involved and how to help. And so um, I don't have a great answer to how can you help <laughs> other than maybe work, you know, you know, kind of work with your local community and promote Drupal in your area and try to write about Drupal on your own website and all of these things. But we really need a coordination role, I think, that kind of creates a marketing plan <laughs> and then kind of figures out how people can contribute as part of a bigger plan. So thinking of the, the different industries and verticals that Drupal is in and thinking about what we currently have, like our distributions, mm -hmm. and then there's the plan for the recipes. Do you think it'd be good to highlight those and promote those? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, one way you can probably all help, just to circle back to that real quick, is you all have the relationships with your customers. You know, you do projects. It's your customer, right, uh, if you're an agency. Uh, but getting the references, I think, is key. Like, being able to go to your customers and ask that, they are willing to be a reference, write a use case, a case study, and bring those case studies to Drupal.org. I think that's one way that everybody can help uh, promote your customers. And in the process, you can promote yourself, too. Um, and so it's hopefully a win-win uh, for all, all, the, all the stakeholders. Uh, but I think the recipes are great um, because then we can <clears throat> have recipes and have 
and promote the recipes with case studies uh, along the same way. Um, yeah. So I have a couple of questions in on GitLab again. <laughs> so with, uh, with Drupal's GitLab CI tests, will, will they be agnostic or packaged in a way that agencies can use them within their own workflows? Especially the automated tests, like accessibility. Um, I don't know. Maybe Neil knows. Yeah. We don't know, yeah. Sorry, I'm not the GitLab expert. Um, yeah, but these are good questions. Yeah. And Maybe. Maybe somebody can give um, Neil a microphone. I or have a microphone here, Neil. Or will those tools be open source? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can use the same testing uh, on a custom module as you would for a module on Drupal.org. So that would be about the same. So yeah, there's some reuse there. Uh, but uh, yeah, testing a Drupal project uh, on Drupal.org, like a module or a theme or whatever, like that's different from end-to-end -end testing a website. Uh, for a website, you want uh, integration tests and you know, more uh, kind of uh, behavior-driven development tests to test the whole thing, not just a bunch of parts. OK. I'm thinking about the, OK, you, I won't go too much into that part, but you know the, the automated accessibility testing? So there's that aspect. But then currently on Drupal.org, you have the option as a maintainer to opt into security advisory policy or into the security team coverage. Is there, and you get a badge then on the, your project page saying you're covered by the security mm -hmm. team. Do you think we can move towards something like that for accessibility so that maintainers can opt in yeah. and, and say, yes, I, I commit to adhere to the, W tag or A tag standards? Yeah. I think for my initial reaction is that I like that idea, right? Um, if, if you are the maintainer of a project and um, you want to make a commitment to accessibility, which today that's not a requirement for a contributor project, but if you say, you know, I will commit to this accessibility level, I think it would be nice if um, people could state that, right, on the mm -hmm. project page. And obviously that doesn't guarantee that they'll be actually accessible, <laughs> but at least it demonstrates that they are, that, that they would be willing to accept patches and consider accessibility bugs as serious bugs to fix. And then if you have it on the project pages, what's nice about it is that as an end user, you can now fil filter modules by accessibility too, because if you are a certain kind of organization, that might be really important to you. More and more we see government mandates around yeah. accessibility. So you may want to filter modules by um, accessibility compliance, let's say. Um, and so yes, I think that would be a good idea. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of little details that um, are to be figured out, or there's no guarantees, that kind of stuff, but at least um, I, I think it's think a it good idea, nice. and it's Tom's idea, wherever he's sitting. <laughs> but uh, like, does it would increase awareness, even among developers, that this is something that they should strive for yeah. and achieve? Um, exactly. Regardless of whether they've opted in, is going, oh, maybe I should. Right. Well, I agree. So, sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yes. Um, switching then a uh, topic to the automatic updates. So. Do you think this will also ship with a tool that you could have the automated, eventually, it's like a later phase perhaps, uh, that the automatic updates project could commit the code to Git so you're not just doing it in a development environment mm -hmm. and then you can push it through? Or is that really more for the hosting companies to provide a, a way to do that? What, do you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And I'm kind of curious to see how different people will use it, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I can see some people using it the way I demoed it, where mm. you hit a button and it updates your site. That will probably be scary for many organizations 
because they, they use a deaf staging production workflow, obviously. Um, so, you know, we'll have to fit into those workflows. But even in those workflows, um, you know, they probably will use Composer and, and command line scripting. Um, but even so, maybe there's a way to do it this way where, um, you know, maybe you can upgrade a staging environment with clicking buttons, if you will, mm. and then push to production. So, I don't know. I think people will figure out different ways to make it part of their workflow, um, depending on their risk averseness, um, depending on um, their resources as well. Like, not everybody has deaf staging production workflows. I think it's that uh, difference or conflict maybe between the needs of enterprise mm -hmm. uh, sites and agencies who are working with it and then the end users that maybe the, the smaller sites, you know. I do feels a bit more like that other CMS between with W that it, it's more towards that sort type of audience than necessarily enterprise. Seems yeah. like a bit of a... I think what we're building is actually nice in that it allows these enterprise use cases really well. Um, you know, we have all the right tools for enterprises today with Composer, I think, and then <clears throat> automated updates uh, and project browser is actually built on top of it, but just kind of makes it a lot more user friendly, but it's not like two different ways of doing things in many ways. It's, you know, just making these complex, powerful tools available in, a, in an easier to use way. And so in that way, we can perfectly cater to both, which is the magic, I think, you know? And you can even start with the UI, and then as you get, your site gets bigger, or you get more serious, and you need to like move into uh, a more typical enterprise workflow, you can, and you won't have to make any changes. So it's a great way to get people started and experiment with Drupal, and even for a small site, maybe it's perfectly fine. The site grows and grows, maybe it becomes more important. And now you can be more serious between quotes about it too and, and take it to that next level, all with the same software, which is, to me, seems like a huge, compelling, um, right, a very compelling story versus like, oh, you know, a negative. It's a positive, not a negative. So, Do you think it would help new adopters who, or, or even new developers, sort of download it, play with it, and then? maybe start treating Drupal like I did as a hobby and get more involved? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of the things, so I think a lot of us probably, a lot of people in the project, they got involved because um, they used Drupy, Drupal, Drupy, Drupal for a hobby project or a small project. And, um, you know, it could have been uh, their soccer website or their blog or something small and simple. Uh, maybe raise your hand if that's, how many of you got involved with a small site? Yeah, there's a bunch of hands, see? Maybe 20 people that got involved because Drupal was accessible and easy and it allowed them to do something quickly. Um, and now a lot of us are, you know, kind of grew up with Drupal and ended up building these large complex websites as well. And so that's a, a very interesting recruiting dynamic, you know? And it's important that we don't completely lose that. And I think a lot of the, the work that we're doing today project browser and automatic updates and et cetera, et cetera, we'll make it, we'll bring that back a little bit. Like admittedly, we've lost that a little, a little bit along the way. Um, and so if we can make it easy for people to get involved with Drupal um, and, and make Drupal a little bit more user friendly for smaller projects, uh, it's a great way to recruit contributors. Because what happens is you start with Drupal, you build, things through the UI, and then it's like, ah, oh, I wish it could do this. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to like maybe dabble a little bit with codes, and like all, of, and before you know it, you're building modules and contributing back to Drupal, so, um, you know? And yeah, so uh, finding Drupal developers is a, an issue for all the Drupal agencies I've talked to yes. here at DrupalCon. Do you have any other ideas on how to? Yeah, a lot of ideas, yeah. I mean, I think, <laughs> Uh, I was talking to some uh, Drupal agencies last night, actually, and um, a lot of them uh, allowed their uh, employees to contribute to Drupal as a tool to recruit people. Because guess what? Um, you know, a lot of the 
the best Drupal contributors or aspiring Drupal contributors. They want to work for companies that allow them to give back as part of their job. It doesn't mean like full time necessarily, but you know, maybe several hours a week that can be set aside for them to uh, contribute back to the project or make it part of their, um, make it part of the, the rhythm of the organization. Meaning, sometimes I see uh, agencies and companies, you run into a bug, they just fix the bug on their local environment and never contribute it back. And well, that's a little sad and can be frustrating to people that work at these organizations. And so they like to work for companies where you run into a bug or you have to add a feature. They're allowed some time to then contribute it back to the project. And that's really nice because I think it allows, and hopefully a lot of you feel that way, it allows you to be part of something bigger. You know, you're like a part of the Drupal project, not just as an end user, but as a contributor. And um, you can actually learn a lot of things from contributing too. Like, talk to a lot of contributors that say, I've learned so much <laughs> from contributing to Drupal. And so it's good for career development, it's good for attracting some of the best talent to Drupal. So I think it helps and then you should advertise it. And that's one of the reasons why we have the credit system too. Uh, and companies use the credit system to show potential uh, employees like, hey, if you come work here, we contribute back. We allow you to contribute back and it's, um, you know, I think it's, I think, I think it helps you hire great talent. It definitely does. It's, yeah. it's definitely a, a, a promotion tool, if you know, uh, for recruitment process, I think. The fact that you can provide people at the time, they'll want to work more, perhaps, uh, with your company. But I have a few questions in, um, to, on the Drupal learning curve. And, you know, what can be done to help new developers overcome that? To make it easier for them to get involved? You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a great question, and there's probably not a quick and easy answer, but... And that's a new question. Uh, yeah. That's been an, an ongoing, um, you know, journey. But I think we can do a lot more, I think, um, around sort of the onboarding of people too. Like, I'm gonna give another example maybe, and I think it's an opportunity for the Drupal Association too, but when you join the project, typically people will create an account on Drupal.org. And when you do, right now, that's it. <laughs> You've got an account. But if you think about what other organizations do, they usually nurture people. So maybe a week after or immediately, you get an email because you created an account and the email will say, now do this. <laughs> or they point you to things, you know, and they have like this nurturing process to get people, uh, you know, let's say in our case, productive. And they support that journey. Maybe we email them a video. Hey, you create an account. Watch this five minute video to learn about how we work together. <laughs> Watch this video to learn how to make your first contribution. You know? And so that I think we don't do. So there's all, all this untapped potential, I think, to help people along. But that's on Drupal.org, I think. Um, I th you know, there's training, documentation, books, uh, all these things that can help people get, get started. Simon wants to know if there are any specific plans to improve documentation. Um, I don't know if there are specific plans. I'm, I'm sure. Various people in the community are working on improving documentation. I, I'm not sure I know all the details. Yeah. Um. So, change uh, topic. Uh, you mentioned in one of your slides about all the great work that we've done, like we're Symphony 6 ready, we're nearly there for uh, PHP 8.2, and you also mentioned smaller core. Mm -hmm. So, how do you make the decisions of what features leave core, what features are going into core? Somebody's mentioning the paragraphs module, you yeah. know, then we have layout builder, but you know, how do you decide what should be in core and what yeah. shouldn't be? It's a good, good uh, question. <clears throat> There's a couple of different ways we think about it, I would say. Um, some, some things we decide um, sort of grassroots, I would say. And so people just contribute things. <laughs> and when we see them, they're like, wow, that's cool. That should be in core. 
So that's one way that happens, which is great. Uh, another way sometimes is we look at, um, you know, a principle that we use for a core is like if it's in core, it should be used a lot, you know? Like it should be infrastructure. It shouldn't necessarily be something used by 2% of the people using Drupal. And so we, we try to apply that filter. And it's actually also the filter that we applied to remove things from core. <laughs> so we remove things like aggregator and fora module. And that's because when we look at the adoption of these features, we felt like they were not used enough to warrant inclusion in core. And so that's another principle that we do. Um, and then the third piece I would say is like we do, I organize like a Drupal product survey every few years around every major release and we survey everyone in the Drupal community. And people kind of vote, if you will, about what things they would like to see in core. And so we use that as, a, as an input as well. And so for example, the last survey, um, auto automatic updates was like the number one thing by far. And so that's how we decided that we should have that in core. Okay. So there's, a, there's very grassroots ways and then there is kind of top down ways based on community inputs. It's not like just me deciding it. It's like, you know, we go through a survey and a process of looking at the data, um, that kind of stuff. And then there is also this lens about, you know, core should be about infrastructure. Um, and so we actually talked a little bit about this in the previous Dries note in Portland, where we look at how many people use it, what's the effort to maintain it as well, and we kind of try to decide if it's core worthy um, that way. So, um, and then we sometimes we move things from contrib to core. I don't think I've fi you know completed that point, but uh, if something gets built in contrib and it gets really widely adopted to the point that basically everybody installs it, <laughs> then we move it into core. And examples of that are what was called CCK as well as views. These were two modules um, that basically almost everybody used. And so we felt, all right, it's better if we put it in core because then we can maintain it. Um, in core and we can kind of simplify a few things around guaranteeing a good upgrade process and, and that kind of stuff. So. I think Path Auto is the one that's for me. I that's use it on every site. Yeah, that's, yeah. Is it the number one module right now? It's, yeah, it is. No. Definitely in the top five, I think. Uh, that's Token is probably one of them. Sure, so these questions. might be candidates for inclusion, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just uh, changing topic ever so slightly, like going a bit back to the promotion, but Drupal Commerce, you know, is quite powerful, and it's sort of the leading Drupal platform for e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Why is it not promoted as much or, or talked oh, about? Should, yeah. I don't know the answer, but it should be promoted more because it's pretty a great set of modules to build. You know, for a certain category of commerce websites, it's like excellent. You know and very full featured and powerful capabilities. But that's a good example of like what we need to promote more because they have incredible references. There's like 60,000 websites using Drupal Commerce. Wow. It's a lot of sites, you yeah. know? Um, and some of these sites are pretty impressive sites. I was actually talking to Ryan, who is, um, you know, sort of the founder of Drupal Commerce. I don't know if Ryan is here, but um, he was talking about a website of I won't say the name, but it's a pharmaceutical company uh, that uses um, Drupal Commerce to, I think they sell COVID tests. Um, <laughs> and they're now doing billions of dollars in like e-commerce revenue through Drupal Commerce. Incredible, incredible use case. Um, and, and that's just one of the sites, you know, of the 60,000. So there's all these great sites using Drupal Commerce, but it goes back to like, we need to have some promotion around Drupal Commerce. And again, Drupal Commerce in a way competes with large commerce platforms. And, and commerce is a larger industry than content management. You know, <laughs> like CMS is small, commerce is large. So we're up against the commerce tools of the world, the Magento's of the world, these large companies. Um, 
And so you could think these companies probably have marketing teams of you know, 20, 30 people that all they do is promote commerce. And so we have nothing. So um, I think that alone, we could spend a lot of time and effort promoting our commerce solution. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to 20, 30 people to promote Drupal Commerce, but just promoting it better, I think, um, could go a very long way. So I'm conscious that we're out of time. <laughs> it's now flashing at me. Um, but I do have two more quick questions. I'll be, I'll be brief. So are you still willing to submit a video recipe for Umami? Yes. And what, reci what recipe would it be? That project. <laughs> Together we can do it. What recipe? Oh, good question. Well, actually, it's funny, a fun anecdote. Like one of the things we like to do is write a cookbook together, because she's a great cook, and I like photography, and we have all these ideas for recipes. So we would love to contribute a recipe. We don't know which one, but uh, we'll find right. something. And last question: huh? Where did you source the amazing background pictures you had in your slides? Did where did you source? Where did you get the, the amazing oh, pictures you so had in your slides? I actually don't know. So I work with a designer. So I make black and white slides, I call them, ugly slides. Um, and then I hand the slides to her, and she makes it all pretty. And she has various sources to get uh, the artwork in the slides. Yeah. And I'm very lucky amazing. that I can. It's Ash, and some of you have met her. She's been helping with my slides for many years. And um, actually, we were talking about this the other day as well, but like uh, around 10 years ago, I decided to get serious about my Dries notes because I felt like I only get the stage in front of the Drupal community, like at large, if you will, twice a year. And uh, before that, some of you might remember, I actually presented black and white slides. <laughs> and uh, about 10 years ago, I said, you know what, I'm going to actually spend a lot of time and, and money too creating slides and upping the production quality. And so I hired a designer to help me. And uh, I still work with her today. And so yeah. all the credit goes to her. Well, she so. does an amazing job. Yeah, well, she does. You uh, also give an amazing keynote. So thank, thank you, you very much, Therese. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.